1989, a man called Bob Lazar walked into a Las Vegas TV station and gave a remarkable interview. He said that he'd worked out in the Nevada desert at a top secret facility known as Area 51. He said he worked on a highly classified project, reverse engineering recovered alien spacecraft. His story was a worldwide sensation and Area 51 became a household name, synonymous with UFOs, secret projects and little green men. And yet, neither the US government nor its military have ever denied his claims and they still don't officially confirm that Area 51 exists, despite satellite photos proving it does. Many dismiss Bob Lazar as a fantasist, and yet others see him as a whistleblower, exposing a government cover-up of UFOs and alien contact. I am convinced, based on my research and the individuals whom I've had contact in the U.S. intelligence community, that the U.S. government does indeed have uh, craft that meet the description of many of the UFO reports. My personal opinion, uh, based on comments I've gotten from uh, the Deputy Director for Science and Technology at CIA, would seem to indicate that Bob was perhaps an unwitting participant in a program designed to introduce someone with a technical background to some elements of the UFO research projects going on out at the test site. I have no doubts that Lazar actually was in a place where top secret investigations were going on. I'm not sure about all the details that have emerged from his account, but he certainly gives me the impression that he was actually there. Do I believe Bob Lazar? My answer to that is yes. And Hex is going, is going on uh, eight years that I've known him, his story has never changed. He wasn't in it for publicity, he wasn't, surely wasn't in it for the money, he lost everything he had. Uh, I believe he's since, since, totally sincere. As far as I can tell, he's a bright guy who t tells a great tale and who's told it often to people who have not checked on him, who accept the notion that well the government wiped his slate clean. Basically I think uh, he had an experience. I think uh, he saw some things that shocked him, was subject to some conditions and experiences that were very unnerving to him and very profound. He said you would love to see what's, what's out there because it's like beyond science fiction. He said, and I wish I could talk to you about it, but I can't. And that's as close as he ever got to telling me anything that happened out there. You'll find many people who have seen these discs. Question is, where do they come from? Uh, Bob Lazar may be one of the few people who can tell us that they're from somewhere else. I've no doubt that there's a relatively small number of people within the intelligence, military intelligence and scientific and technical intelligence community who are aware of what's going on and an even smaller group who are actually organizing top secret research into this phenomenon. There's been an operating airbase out at the location known as Area 51 since the 1950s when it was home to the CIA's top secret SR-71 Blackbird spy plane. Then in the 1970s, 
it became the test flight center for the F-117 stealth fighter and the B-2 stealth bomber. It's fairly public knowledge that we have a super secret facility uh, in the mountains uh, in northern Nevada, uh, referred to as Groom Lake, uh, Area 51 of the uh, Nellis uh, Air Force Base test range. Uh, it's also been uh, referred to as, uh, as Dreamland. This is an area that has been known but officially denied for many decades. All of our super secret aircraft uh, have been developed and test flown out in this particular area. So it only makes sense that if you have something as sophisticated as a flying saucer and the related technology to that, then that would certainly be one of the prime locations you'd want to go. What you see is an ordinary looking Air Force base. It's, it's nothing to write home about, but because the government won't talk about it, everyone wants to see it. The military has never said there are no UFOs. It's never directly denied any of the Area 51 stories. It would have been so simple when these claims came out, these Papoose Lake claims, for the military to simply say, look, we have nothing there. They could take a few reporters to this area and show them nothing there. The military hasn't done it. The military has stonewalled. It has remained silent. And that's the most damning thing that they can do. Area 51 to this day is not acknowledged. That is to say, the Air Force does not admit that it exists. This status has been maintained very carefully, particularly in the last few years. The puzzle is that the base has clearly been very active for quite a while. And you can see that there are about uh, 700 to 1,000 people traveling from Las Vegas every day. So. Essentially, the bulk of what has gone on there in the last 10 years um, has not emerged from the black. This airplane was, the program was terminated. The airplanes were put in mothballs for 20 years before they admitted the existence of the aircraft. There's programs that they're working on today that are 50 years ahead of anything that you and I can even conceive of, and that we may never, they ne may never see the light of day. Would you say it's America's most top secret military base? As far as, a, as far as an operational test facility, it's probably the most secret test facility in the free world, yes. So there is no question that the facility is there, and the government has said very little in the past about it. Now the real question, I suppose, is are there any flying saucers out there? No one had associated flying saucers with Area 51 until Bob Lazar's interview hit television screens around the world. He said that he worked at an underground facility called S4. The top secret project was codenamed Galileo. They would call it a specific time. For instance, the operator would say, Mr. Lazar, it's now 4.15 a.m. We expect you to be at McCarran Airport at 4.45. Your plane will be leaving at such and such time. I'd drive there, check in, board the plane, and the plane would fly out to Groom Lake. It would land there. I'd get off the plane and wait, and there would be a bus to take me and whoever else was going to uh, S4, Papoose Lake, which is about 15 miles south of there. And uh, then I would check in at S4. Tell me about how you felt on your very first trip out. The first trip out there was, uh, it was actually very exciting because it seemed so cloak and dagger to me, especially after I got in the bus with the blacked out windows. I, I kind of thought that was neat. Uh, drove out to the site and then uh, it was checked in, guards walking around with guns and uh, I, I was sure what I was working on was going to be pretty fascinating. He says that within a few days of working out at S4, he was shown an actual flying disc in one of the hangars. When I was brought in by bus, and for the first time, one of the hangar doors, the one on the end, was open. The bus drove up and we stopped there, and 
at clear as day in the hangar, taking up almost all the hangar was the disc. Uh, looked like something right out of a science fiction movie. And as I walked in there, I thought, well, this is the new advanced aircraft we've been working on, and this is why people keep seeing flying saucers, because it's ours, and we've just been testing it probably for all these years. And what, what color and size was that? It was a uh, dull stainless steel, pewter gray, very uh, unimpressive color-wise about 52.8 feet in diameter and about 16 feet high. So was it actually a recovered craft that you were working on or was it one that um, scientists had built as a mock-up of, of a recovered craft? Well, whether it was recovered, given or what, it was not built as a mock-up. It, it was an alien craft built on another world. There was absolutely no doubt about that. The Tsar claims that he was one of only 22 people who had something called majestic clearance to work on the craft itself. The whole aim of the project was to take these craft, or the one in particular that I was working on, and try and duplicate its systems and subsystems with earthly materials. The work that I did basically entailed back engineering the power and propulsion system and I opted to start with the uh, the power the the reactor that that ran the craft I knew immediately if his credentials could be verified, if even part of his story could be verified, it'd be one tremendous expose. George Knapp was a long-standing TV reporter. He'd heard enough of the UFO rumors over the years to appreciate how big a scoop this could be if Lazar was telling the truth. He gave me uh, uh, information about his background, educational background and employment background. I started with, uh, with his claim to have worked at Los Alamos Lab. We went to Los Alamos and uh, got nothing uh, even close to cooperation. Uh, they wouldn't uh, respond to our phone calls. They say we have no information on Bob Lazar. There's nothing in the files. I said, are you sure now? No, nothing in the files. I showed him uh, the, f the phone book entry that Bob had kept that said, uh, he was there. I showed him the newspaper article that, that showed that he was there. Basically, uh, Los Alamos Lab um, tried to thwart me at every step. We're completely uncooperative in trying to get information about Bob, and I, and I found that to be the case at every step of the way in trying to verify his background. Thursday, 12.37 p.m. Former NASA mission specialist Bob Exler had heard about Area 51 and Groom Lake when he worked on the Apollo and Space Shuttle projects. He was intrigued by Lazar's claims and started to investigate. Uh, I did uh, a variety of research uh, relative to Bob Lazar. I actually met him. Uh, I obtained a copy of his, uh, what they call a W-2 form, which is one of the um, uh, IRS documents associated with, uh, with pay. Uh, his particular form indicated that he worked for the U.S. Department of Naval Intelligence. Uh, they informed me that it was a genuine document. It was not something that had been fabricated. There were a variety of numbers, uh, contract numbers and so forth, uh, issued on the document, which I was able to research, again, finding that uh, these were uh, highly classified uh, numbers. In fact, uh, Internal Revenue Service ran into a, a brick wall when it came to trying to track down uh, the actual employer uh, associated with the, with the document. And then again, with the Social Security Administration, we found that Bob Lazar's records had in fact been, been bleached clean. There was nothing there in spite of the fact that the document uh, clearly indicated that uh, Social Security taxes had been taken out of his pay. Uh, 